back in first timothy made it to chapter 5 in verse 8 it said but if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel so the context is referring to the widow and if she's got a son or someone that won't provide for her this guy has denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel that is worse than an unbeliever if he won't provide for those of his own house you know the average lost man that you see today he'll he'll provide for his own house he'll take care of his wife and kids he'll go to work on average but if you're a saved guy and you won't even do that you're worse than an infidel that is you're worse than an unbeliever paul says in verse 9 let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old having been the wife of one man so she shouldn't be taken in the number that is she shouldn't be taken onto the roll to be supported financially by the church if she is under three score years old. So what's three score years old? Well, a score is 20. So three score would be 60. So if she's under 60 years old, don't even, Paul says not to even support her financially. She's too young. She has to be, one of the qualifications, she has to be at least 60 years old. Then he says, having been the wife of one man. So she must be single right now. And because if she's not single, if she's uh, got a husband, a new husband, or about to get a husband, then he would be able to support her, and the church shouldn't have to. So this must be a 60-year-old widow that's single. And he said, well reported of for good works. So this is a big one. She must be godly. She must have good works. She should have been maintaining good works all this time. Well reported of. That means there's people that, that know she's doing good works. You could go up to them and ask them, and they would say, this is a godly woman. So it does matter that people see you do good. We're not doing good for people to see us. But it does matter that people do, do see you doing good. And if you do good, people will see it and take note of it. And you will be well reported of for good works. For example, if she have brought up children. Is this somebody that raised their kids, took care of their kids their whole life, made sure they had what they needed, like a good mother? Well reported of for good works. Has she brought up children? If she have lodged strangers, she's hospitable, that is. If she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So you see, there's just a few examples of her good works brought up children Lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, relieved, afflicted, diligently followed every good works. She's not been chasing the evil stuff that a single woman might end up chasing. She's followed every good work. But then look what he says in verse 11. But the younger widows refuse. He's, he's looking for... Three score years old, 60 years old and up. Not the younger widows. He says the younger widows refuse. So Paul sees that if they're three score years old, 60, and not younger, they most likely aren't going to get married again. And see, they're wanting to take on women that aren't going to get, that are single and not going to get married again for to support them. If they're going to have a future husband and are 
they're planning on getting married right now, then their husband can support them. And he says, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. So when they wax wanton, they're going to basically go against their pledge to the church that they were going to remain single and get support from the church. And they're going to begin going after men, dating men, flirting with men. And they're going to get a husband. And therefore, it was a waste all that time for the church to give them all that financial support. And obviously, Paul's not against them getting married. Because look what he says in 1 Corinthians 7. If you look at 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 9, or no, he says in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 7, 8, he says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Paul wasn't married. He says if they can remain unmarried, it's good if they can be like that. But then he says in verse 9, but if they cannot contain, let them marry for it's better to marry than to burn. So it ain't that he's against them getting married, remarried if their husband's dead. It's just if they're going to be took on and supported by the church, he wants it to be older ones that don't have plans of getting remarried. The younger ones most likely are going to wax wanton. They're going to be um, more likely to be burning in their lust and have to get remarried because he says but the younger widows refuse for when they have begun to wax wanton against christ they will marry you see much more likely for the younger widows to get married than the ones that are three score and up and then he says in verse 12 having damnation because they have cast off their first faith now where it says damnation that's not in the sense of salvation. This doesn't mean that they're losing their salvation here. It doesn't mean that they're, they've cast off their faith and they've lost their salvation. There's, there's times when damnation is not referring to somebody going to hell. There's times when salvation doesn't refer to salvation in the sense of going to heaven. Uh, for example, you look at back in 1st Timothy chapter 2 at verse 15 it says notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety that wasn't talking about she'll be saved because she's with child it was talking about her being saved from deception especially while she's bearing a child so words like saved don't always mean safe from hell. Words like damnation don't always mean eternal damnation in hell. But she's going to have damnation because she's cast off her first faith. It's <clears throat> in the sense of her pledge to remain single for the sake of what Paul taught back in 1 Corinthians 7, 39-40. So look at 1 Corinthians 7, 39. He says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So you see, she would be, be he's pretty much saying she'd be better off to remain single if she could. And the church would take her on for the support and she'd be able to serve God better as a single woman, as he also talks about in 1 Corinthians 7. And the younger widows back there in 1 Timothy, they began to wax wanton against Christ. They're good, then they marry. And in the sense of them you know, going back on their pledge to the church to remain single and get the support, they have damnation and they cast off their first faith. Their first faith, the faith they had when their husband first died. 
that they were going to rely on the Lord and trust in the Lord to take care of them through the church. So, to remain single for the sake of what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 7, 39 through 40 is, is what this is talking about. So, basically, the church wanted to only take, <clears throat> take on widows who were <clears throat> needing support because they didn't have sons who could provide for them, because they did not have future husbands that were going to provide for them. It's not saying that they he doesn't want them to get remarried if they need to. It's that when it comes to the widows getting support, it needs to be a widow who does not have sons that could take them on and support them, or it's not a widow that's going to have a future husband that could take them on and support them. So he says in verse 13, And with all they learn to be idle. See, when a... When a woman loses her husband, she's in danger of a few things because she no longer has that head in her life. She's no longer got her father that she's under. And her husband died, so she's no longer under her husband. So she learns to be idle. When they should really be studying to be quiet. Look at 1 Thessalonians. 4 and verse 11. She learns to be idle. But in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, what does Paul say? And that ye study to be quiet. So she needs to learn to be quiet. And he says, and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. She can work with her hands. And just because you don't have a job does not mean you can't work with your hands. There's all kinds of things that you can do without having a full-time job. Working with your hands will keep you out of trouble, keeping you busy. You study to be quiet. Don't learn to be idle. But that she's in danger of that when she's becomes single again. Let's look at some some more. In Matthew twelve thirty six, so she learns to be idle, and she's going to be in a situation where she can get in other people's business. She can ha she has all kinds of time to get into trouble. In Matthew twelve thirty six, the Lord says, "But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment." So every idle word that she's going to say. She's going to have a whole bunch of time to talk on the phone, get on Facebook, get into other people's business. And every idle word that she says, she'll give account. So, and with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. Look at Ezekiel 16, 49. Ezekiel 16, 49, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So you see, um, one of the sins of Sodom, you know, Sodom that got destroyed in Genesis 19, their sins was not just homosexuality. It was pride. It was fullness of bread. It was abundance of idleness. Idleness is not a good thing. You don't want to have a whole bunch of time where you're doing nothing. You know, the common saying, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. You don't want to have idle hands. You want to work with your own hands. She learns to be, but the, the widow, she loses her Husband, and many times she'll learn to be idle instead of studying to be quiet. She wanders about from house to house. Look at Second Thessalonians three eleven through twelve. Second Thessalonians three eleven. He says, "For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies." 
they're not busy doing anything beneficial. They're busy bodies going around from house to house, running their mouth, causing trouble. So he says in verse 12, 2 Thessalonians 3.12, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So with quietness they work. They need to study to be quiet, not learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. As he says in 1 Timothy 5.13, he said, and with all they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also. And here's that word again, and busy bodies. They're going around from house to house, being a busybody, possibly causing friction between another husband and wife and end up getting their relationship messed up. It happens all the time. Her running her mouth to some other woman and she ends up giving her husband a hard time, and she hurts their marriage, giving her opinion on it. It's none of her business. She's a busy body. It called her a tattler there. And you don't even, the thing is, they don't have to go from house to house today. There's all kinds of ways to get in somebody's house without going there. For example... She's influencing her women friends through Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube, whatever it may be. She's turned into a busybody wandering about from house to house and a tattler. Uh, look at Proverbs eleven thirteen. Proverbs 11 and verse 13. Now, a tattler is somebody that's one that's just going around telling tales. You know, you think about it. When you were in school, what did you get called if you went and told on somebody all the time? You were a tattletale. Always going around running your mouth. Just won't leave nothing alone. If you see it or hear it, you got to go run and tell somebody about it. And that's the way this woman is. Proverbs eleven thirteen: A tale bearer revealeth secrets. See that? He that is a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. So, this woman, you can't tell her nothing. She's going to tell everybody about it. She revealeth secrets. Look at tw uh, Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20 and verse 19. He that goeth about as a tell-bearer revealeth secrets therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips see it's all about those lips the tongue your big mouth paul said study to be quiet with quietness eat your own bread look at proverbs 26 20 It says, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tell-bearer, the strife ceaseth. See, you know, I, I, I can think of women on my head right now that you, as soon as you answer the phone, you can hear them. You, you're not even on the phone with them. Maybe your wife's on the phone with them. You can hear their voice across the room, and it ain't even on speakerphone. It's like their mouth has done came through the phone, blowing any cobwebs out and dust that may be in that phone out. And, But you get rid of them, get them out of your life, the strife ceaseth. You're going to find out that you're no longer just full of just worry and anxiety and Nerves are no longer shot when you remove the tailbearer from your life. You remove the tailbearer from your life, no more strife, no more fights. She's starting it all. Just like where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. 
So where there is no tail bearer, the strife seizeth. Maybe your wife, maybe even your husband has a friend constantly running their mouth, constantly getting you and him, you and her in a fight. Remove that person, the strife seizeth. Proverbs twenty six twenty two: the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. The stuff that she's on there running her mouth about. It, when she, when you hang up the phone, you still, you're still replaying it over and over again. It left a bad taste in your mouth. It left a wound there. It left words that are hard to get out. It ruins your whole night because it left, those words left something. They didn't just stop at that phone call. When you hit, hang up on the phone, it didn't just stop there. It continues going. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. You can't take them back out. It's ruined your day. It's ruined the next day. Maybe even ruined your week. But get rid of the tail bear, the strife seizeth. So it says, 1 Timothy 5.13, And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. See, it's all about the mouth. What did Paul say? Study to be quiet. What did Paul say? With quietness, eat your own bread. What, is he, what did Peter say? Referring to the woman, he said in 1 Peter 3, 4, well, start in 1 Peter 3, 1, he says, Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. See, when she's lost her husband, that's when she's many times will get into trouble. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. See, he's talking about, you know, if, you, if you're a woman and you got a husband that's not a believer, he can be won over by your chaste conversation, how you live your life. Coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So that the woman needs to learn to have a meek and quiet spirit, not running her mouth. And when <clears throat> the widow, she doesn't have that head over her anymore. Her husband died. She's in danger of learning to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And I know this one woman who, <clears throat> she would be a whole lot worse, but her, cus her, her husband is all the time telling her, you just need to stay out of it. Or he'll say, no, you shouldn't tell them that. You know, she'll, this one, she'll hear this one woman say something about another woman, and she'll get on the phone and go tell that other woman what the woman said, and her husband's back there saying, don't get into that. That's none of your business. Don't say that. You see, that's what they lose many times, and they don't have that voice back there telling them that they need to just stay out of other people's business and don't be a busy body. But they go around speaking things which they ought not. So Paul says in verse 14, 1 Timothy 5, 14, he says, I will therefore that the younger women marry. So see, he wasn't, he's not discouraging somebody from getting married. The younger women, he says they should get married because remember in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, he said it's better to marry than to burn. What did he say in 1 Corinthians 7? He says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. You know, let every woman have her own husband. He says the best thing they can do is marry, bear children. If you bear children, you have some kids, you're not going to have time to be idle and wander about from house to house and be a busybody and a tattler. You're just not going to have no as much time. Bear children, guide the house. If you're worried about guiding your own house, 
you're taking care in that. You're not going to be going about from house to house.